Welcome back to another video where I make you question everything you thought you once knew about SIBO. Hopefully in a good way, hopefully in a way that helps you feel better ASAP. But nonetheless, welcome to the beginning of what is probably going to be a really eye-opening series. At least that's my goal for you. This was born when I started to work on my healthcare practitioner course, SIBO Hero, last year. I did what I thought was a deep dive on PubMed, looking at the literature with the accuracy issues and the utility of SIBO breath testing. And I was shook, guys. It is bonkers out there. It's so much worse than I thought it was. We're going to get into a little bit of why, but long story short, I ended up doing a deeper deep dive on PubMed, and that is what I'm now bringing to you, oh people of YouTube. So let's get into the first part of the series, which is the false positives with lactulose. This is by far, by far, by far the biggest problem with lactulose specifically. Let's go ahead and give myself a head bubble and we'll get right into it. And I did think that this was a big enough research project. I actually made a little dorky PowerPoint for you guys, so hopefully you enjoy. Let's weigh the pros and cons of lactulose. Uh, this is an excellent paper, by the way, if you want to look it up. But they said, and this was in 2021, they said lactulose breath testing is used in 44% of all cited studies on SIBO reported from the United States. So it's very commonly used. Studies using lactulose breath test report a higher prevalence of SIBO in IBS patients than studies using glucose tests. Lactulose says that people with IBS have about a 62% rate of SIBO versus glucose says about 21%. Holy macaroni. That is a huge, huge difference. Threefold higher, just eeny, meeny, miny, mo, whatever substrate you pick for your test. That can't be right. Similarly, Similarly horrifying, the prevalence of a positive lacto lactulose test in healthy control subjects with no symptoms whatsoever is about 35%. That can't be right. Why in the world would a bunch of healthy, normal, asymptomatic people have SIBO? Me thinketh something's going on, and this is mighty fishing. But let's continue. Now, when I was a bit earlier in my SIBO practitioner journey, I would mostly look at comparisons between breath tests and aspirate and culture results, in part because this is the bulk of the research when they're looking at pros and cons and accuracy with SIBO breath testing. Now, I'm not saying that this is bad data, but it is going to be really limited, and you'll see why in a few minutes. But I just want to make mention really quick that aspirate culture is far from perfect. If you guys want me to do a video on that down the road, I could, but since this is not done clinically so much, I think a very small minority of people watching this channel have had an aspirin culture. So it doesn't feel like this would be um, as much of a crowd pleaser, I suppose, or it wouldn't be as helpful for many of you. Uh, this is going to come in more handy if you dork out and you read research a lot like me. But just for what it's worth, aspirin culture, far from perfect. The two probably biggest issues, well, three. A, the quantity, the number of bacteria that we label as SIBO has not been clearly established. There are a lot of different reference ranges for this. And this is a point of debate. I have an opinion. Everybody else does too. Um, the other big thing is that it's going to be highly dependent on where the doctor samples in your small intestine. So if they miss the location where the SIBO actually is, it could come back with false negatives. And lastly, about 80% of our gut microbiome cannot be cultured, period. So we are only culturing a very small number of bacteria that are actually coming out of the small bowel when we do this. But nonetheless, this is still considered to be the gold standard for what it's worth. So let's compare lactulose to the so-called gold standard. Breath tests for the non-invasive diagnosis of SIBO. This is a recent systematic review and meta-analysis, 2020. And they gave the sensitivity and specificity for both lactulose and glucose. And they said that the sensitivity was 42% and the specificity for lactulose was 70.6. Now, if some of you are research dweebs like me, or if you're just statistics geeks for whatever reason, uh, typically you would think this bodes well for the conversation of false positives, right? Because low specificity begets higher rates of false positives, people without SIBO being incorrectly told that they have SIBO. So when you look at that, it actually looks like false negatives would be a much bigger problem based off of this because the sensitivity is much lower than the specificity, right? 
Well, this is what I thought for a lot, a lot of years, and I read studies like this, but we're going to get into why this might be a bit flawed to look at this data this way. Another study, there's PubMed ID. In this particular study, they said 16.5% er, of patients had a positive aspirate result versus 31.1% of patients had a positive lactulose result. What the heck? Is it that aspirate culture is undershooting? Or is it that lactulose is overdiagnosing SIBO? We'll find out. Don't you worry. Another study. This is comparing uh, diagnosing of SIBO in irritable bowel syndrome in comparison with quantitative upper gut aspirate culture. And they found that when comparing lactulose breath tests to the aspirate and culture, they found that 35% of people without SIBO showed a positive hydrogen breath test using lactulose. And they found that 41.3% of people without SIBO had a positive methane result on lactulose breath testing. This is a big problem. We cannot be telling people who do not have SIBO that they have SIBO because you know what that means. They're going to obliterate their gut with antimicrobials and antibiotics. They're going to absolutely trash their diet with restrictive eating. They're going to lose their damn mind chasing something that they do not need to chase. So this is a really big problem, but it actually gets worse. But first, I want to make mention of some assumptions and a wild card when interpreting this. And the single biggest assumption, the single biggest problem with breath testing just in general, and this includes glucose as well, is this. This right here. Continuing on, here's this paper I like again, keeping you in suspense. Early elevations in gas production can occur in two major circumstances. One, patients with rapid oral sequel transit time, or OCTT, and two, people with SIBO. The critical issue with this test is the definition of early elevation. And they actually went to say, a positive test cannot be interpreted properly without a concomitant test of oral sequel transit time. We'll get into that. So here's your gut, more or less, and all of the bits. When we talk about oral sequel transit time, oral meaning mouth, sequel meaning cecum, what we're saying is oral sequel transit time is the amount of time it takes the substrate to go from your mouth to your esophagus, your stomach, your duodenum, the jejunum, the ileum, and then finally land in the very, very, very first part of your colon, which is called the cecum. So there's your cecum. And the problem is we don't know what your oral sequel transit time is. I don't know what mine is. Nobody knows what theirs is unless they've had it measured before. And you could be the tortoise or the hare or somewhere in between. And we have no freaking idea. So then we look at tests like this, which say, oh, if, if, uh, if we divide the line right here, right there, if you have a peak before, you know, 60, 90, 120, whatever the lab says, they're all different. If you have a peak before this delineation, then that is small intestine and that's SIBO. And if it's after that line, that ain't SIBO that's coming from the colon. Well, my question to every lab that does this is, says who? And is this true for everybody? We can't possibly assume that every single person on planet Earth has the same oral sequel transit time, right? This does not apply to everybody. Hardly. The research on this is wild. This would be another one that would require a pretty deep dive on my part and a lot of time and effort. But let me know in the comments if you want me to do a video talking about uh, the populations who would have a fast or slow oral sequel transit time. And that might help you interpret these results somewhat. Um, if, if again, we're going to get through the rest of these these couple of uh, videos that I'm going to upload. I don't know if that would be as helpful as you might think it is right now, but just know that a lot of people have very fast oral sequel transit times. Some people have very slow oral sequel transit times, and there's no way of knowing for sure unless you get it measured. And the wild card with this in particular is that lactulose speeds up transit time. So in particular, we have no freaking clue because lactulose actually speeds you up. So that's going to give a totally different number compared to glucose or a solid meal or inulin or anything else. So let's get into a really neat body of research. There's not a ton. There are, there's only a limited number of studies that have done this. But 
some brilliant researchers have done SIBO breath testing with a transit study called scintigraphy. So what they do is they put a radioactive isotope in the lactulose or the glucose. And when you drink it down, they can use imaging to track where that radioactive isotope is in your body. So they can tell when you have the gas peak, or if you have you know, the hydrogen or methane peak on a breath test, they can compare it to the imaging that they took at that very moment. And they know if the stuff is in your colon or the small bowel or somewhere else for that matter. So let's get into it. There's a few that are really neat. Uh, so this is a, I believe, a 2011 study, if I remember correctly. Combined oral sequel scintigraphy with lactulose hydrogen breath test demonstrates that breath tests detect oral sequel transit, not small intestinal bacterial overgrowth in patients with IBS. And as a starting point, I just want to point out, lactulose breath testing has been used for many decades, but the purpose, the sole purpose up until 10, 20 years ago was to measure oral sequel transit time. And then somebody somewhere came along and decided magically that it measures SIBO for some reason, when there's a lot of research that had been using it for this other purpose all along. But let's get into it. Let's get into the juicy deets. So these folks said, we found that 63% of IBS patients in the study had an abnormal lactulose hydrogen breath test using the criteria of an increase in hydrogen of 20 parts per million within 180 minutes. So three hours. This is a long test like what Genova would do, which I think is bonkers. Uh, this proportion is very similar to those reported in a number of previous studies. Similarly, our finding that 35% of patients with IBS had an abnormal lactulose test using 20 parts per million by 90 minutes is also consistent with previous reports. However, when these criteria were applied in healthy controls in previous studies, a similar proportion was found to have an abnormal test using either criteria. Again, that's pretty fishy. We found that the T99 or 99 MTC had reached the cecum in 88% of patients with IBS before the abnormal rise in hydrogen occurred. These data suggest that abnormal lactulose breath test found in IBS patients using current criteria detect small bowel transit, not SIBO. 88% false positive rates? Yikes. Yikes. They did mention three patients had a genuine positive SIBO test, meaning that they had a peak in hydrogen production well before, I think 15 minutes was the criteria, 15 minutes prior to the radioactive isotope reaching the cecum. Of note, two of those patients had a positive breath test within 10 minutes of ingesting the test meal. That's fascinating. The mean time, the average time required for positive sequel radioac radioactivity for all patients with IBS was 71 minutes, plus or minus seven minutes, with a range of 10 minutes to 100 and, or 220 minutes. Whew. Okay, so what the heck do we do then? Sure the, as heck, with lactulose, we cannot use a 90-minute cutoff, right? The, the mean, the average oral sequel transit time in these patients was 71 minutes, which is well below the 90 minute mark. And if you think of that's the top of the bell curve analysis. So absolutely, the majority of people had oral sequel transit times well below a lot of labs reference ranges. I know European guidelines say that with lactulose, we should be using a 60 minute cutoff, but that might not even be adequate, because some people have a 10 minute oral sequel transit time. So if we can't even rely on the first breath sample, the 15-minute the breath sample after ingestion of the lactulose, what the heck is the point? Conclusions. These findings demonstrate that an abnormal rise in hydrogen measured in the lactulose hydrogen breath test can be explained by variations in oral sequel transit time in patients with IBS and therefore do not support the diagnosis of SIBO. Oof. Here's another one, though. This is a couple years later. This is 2014. They basically did the same thing. And this, this is a great visual of what they found. So they were looking at different criteria, including scintigraphy, 
for the diagnosis of SIBO. So basically the first one, criteria one, is again, kind of what they said in, in that previous article where an abnormal rise in hydrogen prior to 180 minutes, that was the first criteria. And you could see the difference between IBS and health controls was not a, it was virtually the same. 75% of IBS patients versus 77% of controls. That is completely without value to us. Uh, 90 minutes, similar problem. 31% of IBS patients had a positive lactulose test at the 90 minute cutoff mark, 30% of healthy controls. That gives us diddly squat, absolutely nothing. The double peak, they actually looked at the, the double peak criteria and that was marginally better, but I don't even think this reached statistical significance if I remember correctly. But what I wanna highlight here, look at these. These three right here, big differences between IBS and healthy controls. In the first one, five parts per million, which I'm gonna explain in a minute, five parts per million, sure enough, 39% of IBS patients and only 8% of healthy controls exhibited a positive test with this criteria. That's pretty decent. You're gonna tell some people incorrectly that they have SIBO, but it's not nearly as bad as it was. 10 parts per million, now we're actually weeding out the people who have SIBO from the people who do not. 10 parts per million, that's where you get zero healthy controls getting told that they have SIBO. So this would be excellent specificity. This would be 100% specificity. Now, the difference here is the three that I've highlighted, those are the ones where they use the scintigraphy. So if the person had five parts per million of hydrogen exhaled at least 15 minutes prior to the arrival of the radioactive isotope in the cecum, that was the first one, the five parts per million. Similarly, if they exhaled 10 parts per million hydrogen above baseline prior to the arrival of the isotope in the cecum, meaning that it had to be in the small bowel still, then that's the second one we're looking at in the, the 20 part per million cutoff. That's quite a bit more uh, strict. But again, you can see the wild difference between just willy nilly breath testing, where we are not able to decipher between people who have SIBO and people who do not, versus when we do a concomitant scintigraphy test. That means they mix the radioactive isotope in with the lactulose and you drink it and you do both tests at the same time. They said 34 out of 35, so 97% of the SIBO positive patients and 16 of the 54 negative patients, so about 30% of the SIBO negative patients received a therapeutic trial of antibiotic therapy. This is pretty cool. Beneficial effects of rifaximin on IBS symptoms were observed in the SIBO positive patients. In particular, patients with IBSD and with SIBO reported an improvement in abdominal symptoms, including stool frequency and consistency. However, IBSD patients without SIBO did not benefit because they didn't have freaking SIBO. This is not rocket science, but it's so cool that they confirmed their findings. It wasn't enough that these people did this and they showed the differing rates of positive tests between IBS and healthy controls, they put their money where their mouth was and they said, okay, let's use our criteria. Um, I think they, they based it off of criteria number four. That was the one that they decided was best. And they took those SIBO positive patients and they gave them rifaximin and they compared that to SIBO negative patients who were given rifaximin. Huge difference, huge difference. And I know right now you might be kind of depressed where you might be feeling like you just walked into basically a dumpster fire. But really the question on everybody's mind at this point is, what do we do now? So let me take myself off of head bubble mode. Hold on. Uh, da, da, da. All right, wrapping it up because I always like to keep this practical and just try to, try to point you in the right direction because you come here to YouTube not for entertainment, at least not on my channel. You're not looking for entertainment. You're looking for action steps. What can I do now? And right now, the big summary from this video is I don't recommend lactulose breath testing at all anymore. And we're going to get into the glucose side of things next. And I already did a video maybe a month or so ago about the potential dangers of glucose breath testing. I'll try to put that somewhere on the screen. If not, just search my channel. It's pretty, it's still pretty fresh. Um, 
But this really calls into question if we should be doing breath testing at all. I think lactulose is safer as as far as it's not going to mess with your blood sugar, it's not going to feed candida, it's not going to do anything overtly harmful to you like glucose might, as I covered in that previous video. But it is completely inaccurate, and it's going to tell a ton of people that they have SIBO when in fact they do not have SIBO. So unless you have had syntigraphy done and you know for a fact what your oral sequel transit time is using lactulose specifically, this is a tool that has zero clinical value in my opinion. Now, what I'm going to do, because I realize I'm making really bold statements here and I'm probably depressing everybody on this damn channel, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a link and I'll put it in the comment down below and the description. I have created a folder with every single research article that I read, all of my notes, all of my highlighting, and a copy of the PowerPoints. If you want to fact check me and if you want to read some of these papers and get into the nitty gritty, by all means, I'll give you the tools to do that. I have all the PDFs and all of the notes saved. So I'm going to put that in a Google Drop thing. And I'll probably, I think that what might make most sense is to email it to you. So I'll just ask for your email and then email it to you. But you can feel free to fact check me or read some of these studies. Some of them are really, really good. Um, but yeah, this is just a bummer. This is just a bummer. So if you've had a lactulose test done before, I would say it's pretty useless, unfortunately. Um, I certainly would not repeat the breath test if you've had a lactulose one. I would just, you know, cut your losses where it's at. The question of whether or not you should pursue a glucose test is still up for grabs. Again, we've talked about the safety concerns that I have. Next, we're going to talk about false positives and false negatives associated with glucose-based breath testing. And then at the end of it, we'll, we'll have a powwow and decide what we're going to do with this new information and what does it mean for your SIBO journey. But in particular, those of you who had had lactulose-based breath tests and you had undergone SIBO treatment, you know, on the one hand, this is a bummer because you have probably felt like crap, pun, poop pun intended. You probably have felt like crap for a long time. And then somebody came along with this magical test that gave you a positive test result. Finally, after what felt like a lifetime of your, it's normal, it's all in your head kind of garbage from your practitioners, you finally had that positive test result and you clung to it for all your worth. And now I'm ripping that away and being a meanie. So on the one hand, this is depressing. On the other hand, you could view this as very freeing. You no longer have to shackle yourself to the idea of bacterial overgrowth. You no longer have to shackle yourself to the idea of dietary restriction and elemental diet and antimicrobials and expensive antibiotics because you don't have evidence that that will serve you. And honestly, even people with SIBO, I don't know if that's really going to serve them well. So this opens up this wonderful world of other therapeutic options for you that you can now try. So you could do things like getting back to the unsexy basics like Amy and I talk about in the IBS Freedom podcast. You can get back to going back to your root causes. Like what... What was going on in your life when you went from feeling good to not feeling good? You could go back to just zooming out and looking at your body and thinking about what does a human being need to be healthy? And you could work off of that information instead of shackling yourself to this idea of SIBO. So while I acknowledge that this is probably going to be super like uh, borderline traumatic for a lot of you. <laughs> And, and this was a stressful video to watch. I hope that in the end, you find that it's very freeing and it opens a lot of doors. And ultimately, I hope that this information helps you feel better very, very soon. I'll see you in the next video. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.